It was almost never about food. It was about Tony learning how to be a better person. You're probably gonna find out about it anyway. So here's a little preemptive truth telling. There's no happy ending. One, two, three, four. Chef Anthony Bourdain. Anthony Bourdain. Anthony Bourdain. The renowned chef and best-selling author of Kitchen Confidential. All the TV chefs are so cuddly and adorable, you know, maybe I'm the antidote or something. Has a new program, Parts Unknown. One minute I was standing next to a deep fryer, and the next I was watching the sunset over the Sahara. What am I doing here? I said earlier that I was going to tell you the truth. This is part of it. It was almost never about food. It was about Tony learning how to be a better person. When he threw himself into something, he threw himself completely. Why am I here? Am I insane? He was like, life is about finding a cliff worth jumping off. I'm going to look for something feral and wild. He was a traditional romantic. Reality was never going to live up to exactly how he pictured it. Hey, what's up, man? He was always rushing to get into the scene. He was rushing to get out of the scene, to go somewhere next, even if he had nowhere to go. He was definitely searching for something. You were successful, and I am successful. And I'm wondering, are you happy? I know how hard it must have been for him to reach out to someone and be like, hey, man, I'm not doing well. Nothing feels better than going home. And nothing feels better than leaving home. The bittersweet curse. Travel isn't always pretty. You go away. You learn. You get scarred, marked, changed in the process. You inspire so many people with the show. You have a good karma. Good karma? I think so. Well... <laughs> <laughs> Some of you might ask, how is this food related? If I know. Let me see. Recording of progress. Thank you, dear. She's yeah, I'm I'm in the city right now. Oh, you're in New York? Yeah. Is it pouring? No, I guess not. No, you it is not pouring. Up here, I'm only about 100 miles north, but um, I'm just making sure that I hide the lovely Cheryl in here. Uh, hold on. Hi, there it is. Are you recording? Are you going to use video? Too, I am. At, at, do you want to? No, I, that's I, fine. I always request it, but I know the publicists have thousands of. It's fine. Emails and you know, trying to take care of so many things at the same time. But it's been this nice way of being able to double up on promoting. Uh, you know, so happy to. Well, this is actually I counted. Uh, this is like the fifth time we've spoken. Uh, on this. That's thing. great. Let's yeah. keep it going. I appreciate the <laughs> ongoing dialogue. You know. Me too um yeah i was uh anyway um so i was so so glad to see uh the new documentary the anthony Bourdain film well excuse me uh roadrunner film about anthony Bourdain, and um uh because it's somebody who you know has captured the uh the imagination of so many people you know and you know so there it's there's almost this dichotomy where there's this guy who as i just said you know has captured the imagination of, of so many. And then at the same time, his inner life is still, you know, largely um, a mystery. I mean, you know, I think you got a good amount sort of like, you know, on, 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 on tape there for, for people. But how, how, how much do you feel like you got to know Bourdain in the process of making this one? Well, you know, I think Bourdain was one of the more complicated people I've ever made a film about. I mean, he was somebody, the person who actually he reminded me of the most was Orson Welles, uh, strangely, because I'd done a film oh. about Orson Welles. But because yeah. the way people yeah. described Orson and the way yeah. they described Tony was that they would be slightly different in every exchange with every person. So they were always a slightly different person for everybody, even the, his relationship with his different crews were all different. His relationship with his friends were all different. Like he was a little, little bit of a shapeshifter You're in that way. Mind. Yeah. But also, you know, a great rock and tour, very smart, very right. funny, 
um, and also kind of a self saboteur in ways, <laughs> you know, kind of creating yeah, yeah. boxes for himself that he can't escape from <laughs> in that way. That, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. So I, you know, I, I, there was no way to kind of, uh, to be like, oh, I got him. And in fact, what I kind of realized and what Tony kind of gave me permission to do in the film is to not figure it out per se. I mean, Tony's whole pursuit was about the embracing of gray and ambiguity in life. Mm -hmm. You know, that was something that he really got into in his shows and it's really about questions. And I feel like so much of my work has become much more about questions and answers. And so it's kind of just embracing that of kind of, here's a whole bunch of, you know, information and ideas about this person. And I do think it gives you a lot of understanding, but I think results may vary. You know, people can take away whatever they want from it in their own way. I think it's really on the viewer here to decide. Um, sure. Well, I mean, I think, you know, you talk to so many people from different parts of the life and that it's almost arbitrary, like the people that I know in my world that just, you know, were so uh, caught up with him and taken up with, with him, you know. So he says he does, he sort of presents something to different people. I mean. Oh, it, it's funny because the person I also started thinking him, uh, thinking about him in terms of oddly was, was Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash. Yeah, that because I'd done a so Johnny Cash done a documentary. Project. Yeah, you were yeah, you did exactly. One. Um, but you know, Johnny was also you know the man in black who was very open about his flaws and his addictions, and who was loved by punk rockers and evangelicals. You know, young and old, red and blue. And there's some element of that that Tony had too. But I think a lot of it has to do with somebody who feels kind of vulnerable and flawed and who really wears that on the outside in maybe, a way. Maybe what it is, is it's somebody who has somewhere along the line through maybe through positive or negative painful um, journey realize they're just an open, they're going to be an open, um, like uh, oh, open to anything that kind of presents itself in their world. You know yeah. what I mean? That like, you know, you could see it kind of the Johnny Cash, you know, that last chapter recording some of the most um I don't know, unlikely or just unpredictable material yeah. that he ever did in his entire career, you know, and all of a sudden now he's just like, you know, this uh sort of just open book or something. And and I think that, you know, can be a positive thing. It can also be negative. And one thing for sure that I get it from from your film is that that Anthony Tony Bourdain, you know, he does not want to be comfortable. He doesn't, you know, he he the, he he welcomes drama. And again, that's it can be a very liberating thing, but it can also be really really difficult and painful, as you know, his life. You know. Yeah. Well, I think both those things are true. I think he was very open minded. You know that he yeah, was somebody, it's and it's not that often that you see public figures on television or in our politics or anywhere actually learning or being surprised when they go someplace you know they're all it people feel like they have an agenda and tony says in the film and he said it many times that nothing thrilled him more than to go someplace and have his expectations completely upturned you know and he went out of his way to do that i mean in the wake of the 2016 election the first episode he did was west virginia He's like, I just want to go down and just meet these people and see what they're about. And it's one of his best episodes. Uh, it's you know, the it's, capital of the, uh, right? It's sort of uh, the nerves, the, the, the uh, nerve center of, of the uh, epidemic, right? Of, of uh, opioids. Opioid yeah. epidemic, rather. Um, yeah. Is that, is that where you're getting at? Is that why you chose that area? Or Well, I think in part that, but just, you know, it's kind of a forgotten part of the country. And I think it was a place he just felt like, I don't know what, who these people are. So I want to go meet them and talk to them and, you know, break bread with them and all those okay. things. And like that kind of just open curiosity is so great. It's an interesting coincidence that it's like kind of also the center of a place of real trouble and addiction and, right? And I think, you know, again, he always was attracted 
to that, that idea of, you know, people who were struggling and, and, you know, going through um, issues. I mean, we have some footage of him in kind of a group therapy session for a uh, kind of a, uh, it was uh, for reformed drug users, I think, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't AA, it was like an NA type meeting that Understood, they right, he had right. filmed in um, um, kind of blue collar um, Massachusetts, you know, and, huh? and he wanted again to like know these people and kind of why, you know, how does a, you know, blue collar, you know, mom become an op opioid addict, you know? Yeah, right. And right. those stories, yeah, I mean, that again, you know, is both dramatic and cinematic in a way. And, but I, you know, it's, it's, it gets again back to that point of like, it's real and it's great, but it's also um, painful. And yeah. for Tony, he couldn't just be a voyeur in that way. I mean, this becomes to me kind of the central kind of conflict of Tony's life, which is, he couldn't just observe these things and document them. There's always some element of him that he left behind and it becomes, if you're gonna put kind of a film metaphor on it, you know, is he Willard or is he Kurtz in you know, Apocalypse Now? Is he the kind of rational, darkness. journalistic observer um, or is he the person who's kind of lost their mind and who's the antagonist of the story or the protagonist? Well, the heart of darkness, um, uh analogy is good because the further he goes on the journey, you know, the darker he gets, right? The dar darker or, mm -hmm. you know, more perilous perhaps. Yeah, and, and, and you can see both those characters, both in the book and in the movie as being two sides of the human psyche. Yeah. You know, they're both, it's the same person in a way, two sides of the same mind. Um, and Tony was always navigating that, you know, am I kind of the the person who's transcribing what's happening or am I actually living what's happening? Um, so he, he, as the documentary explores, he starts off, you know, he's a, a cook in some sort of nondescript New York City restaurant, right? Um, yep. And he decides uh, because he feels he is a, actually more of a writer than a cook even in, in his heart, that he's gonna write this expose called Kitchen Confidential, it so happens, right? A name suggested to him by, I think his agent, book agent, publishing agent, or? Well, he actually actor. had the title. Oh, okay, right, he brought it and they, they just said, yeah, that's it, we have the concept. <laughs> yeah, exactly, uh, sorry. So, so and, um, and there begins the, that's sort of the, the, the uh, thing that, that sort of starts the momentum. And I wonder if during those uh, ensuing years, uh, 18 years, uh, I was wondering, uh, if food mattered less and less, right? It, it like it all became about the exploration and his desire to to find the humanity and the connection uh, with the with the places he went with yeah. the people he met. A hundred percent. I mean, I think Tony, of course. I mean, what's interesting about Tony is that he was trained. He went to the CIA, the Culinary Institute of America. He was trained in French style cooking and you know worked in kind of classical french style european style kitchens and understood all the technique and you know was good friends with somebody like eric repair who's you know one of the kind of the you know primary examples of that type of you know michelin star fine dining uh cuisine however he became the champion of street food you know like we've seen this revolution in how we think about food over the last 20 years. And I think Tony was one of the main, you know, um, spreaders of this idea that, you know, the, the love and craft and history in something you might get on a cart and a street in India is just as valuable as what you might get on a plate at a fine restaurant in Paris, yeah. you know? And I think that is absolutely been changing and continues to change how we perceive food and kind of the stories that come for food. And that was something Tony was, way ahead on. And so I think yeah, he was the one who started seeing very early on that, yeah, this food, there are stories in this food, you know, and let's tell those stories, the stories he would find out in the streets, 
Um, and, it's, you know, in the beginning, he also, I mean, his first show was on the Food Network. So, you know, with literally he, the, the producers said, you know, we had to have food in every single scene. You know, they wouldn't let us do a scene that didn't oh. have food in it. And then the No Reservations was on the Travel Channel. They they had to have food in about half the scenes. And then when it got to CNN, they're like, you know, whenever you want food, that's fine. You know, yeah. but well, it's a good, we don't it, care. It, right. Well, it makes sense. Food is a, one of the very few perfect uh, vehicles because it does have that high, low art uh, or, you know, it, I, I, I think it's your absolutely. Right. There's a few things maybe that fall under that where maybe alcohol or something like that, where, yeah. you know, uh, which has a high and low kind of culture to it. Well, know. the other, the other thing I think about food is, you know, food is culture. Yeah. You know, we tend to think of culture as being things like art and film and music. Um, but really food is the most elemental, you know, big food and clothing, you know, is, is also culture, but it's how we define ourselves and our own histories and how we define and perceive other people. Um, and so in that way, it really is like this perfect window into telling any kind of story you want. I mean, he often talked about it as being kind of a Trojan horse to tell these other stories, you know, food yes. was the way to get into it. That, that's the perfect expression. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the name of the documentary, uh, and I understand you directed it, it's called Roadrunner, a film about Anthony Bourdain. It's uh, in theaters July uh, 16th, in theaters, music to our ears. Um, you and me both. And I have a one last kind of question because esoteric maybe that it is, I don't know. I'm just wondering, I mentioned we've spoken a bunch of times, but you know, you always seem so solid and uh, reliable, you know, you have this positive attitude, a smile on your face, <laughs> such a nice guy. But I'm wondering, do these films get inside of you to a degree where they change you. I, you know, I know that's sort of a pithy, maybe question, but I'm just, I just wonder, do they? Uh, yeah, there's no way they can. I don't know. You know, um, and I feel like, you know, often um, when I would start a documentary, I remember having this conversation a few times with somebody I was working on a film with, a subject, and I would say to them, you know, that this this project is going to be like therapy for you, you know, that there's, because you're really asking people about the most important things in their lives and trying to get them to think about them and process them. Um, it took me years to realize, of course, films are therapy for me too, you know, and that there's always part of some issue I want to work out in what I'm, what I'm making, you know, and, and this film, this film had a real kind of emotional tale to it. You know, and part of it is, uh, you know, I was like the group therapist making this film. Yeah. And I came into a world of people full of grief and I had it was, to be- You mentioned it was very, you, know, it wasn't, you started this not long after, I mean, people were, were still grieving his, their loss, right? I mean, I mean, I started shooting about a year and a half after he died, which is not particularly long after. And we shot for an entire year. So those interviews went on, but the fact of the matter is it's going to be years, years and years from now, still before people really work through their feelings, but it was very raw at the beginning. And those interviews were really hard emotionally, but it, does, it also is just not the interviews. I feel like it's the relationships I built with the people before I interviewed them. And still to this day in the conversations I have them, you know, which I, as tough as it is, I actually really love that part of it. You know, like I'm thankful for it. When somebody is totally open and vulnerable, you know, and they're asking me to be vulnerable back, like that's, you know, that's my job. So, um, but I do remember being really um, happy when I was done shooting interviews. I was like, okay, I, because <laughs> yeah. each one took a toll, you know, and it's just a lot to think about the process again loss and our own feelings of grief and shame and anger and all these kinds of ideas that kept coming up yeah you talked i mean we're, we're winding down but you you uh you talked about getting people to be vulnerable in moments and i just flashed my memory flash back to 20 feet from stardom and watching the cameras trained on mick jagger who we've seen thousands of hours of documentaries and 
interview footage, right, of this guy who's, there's no way you, he can't just be Pat, but you played, I think you isolated his backup sing, singer's track. And I just remember seeing him, his mind being blown, like, you know, uh, you, you got to, you were able to do that. And he actually, I think, was he in, kind of brought to tears? Is it my imagine? Is it just my my memory? I, I think he smiles more than he's brought to tears. I he, like okay, in my mind, he's he just he, yeah he's he's because he I think he heard the song for the first time again. You know, it's like uh, uh because of that. You know, and uh, yeah, it's worth seeing uh, as well. But um, anyway, um, well, I'll do something lighter next time. Okay. <laughs> no, no, don't. <laughs> No, no, it's all good. I mean, you know, you can find something deep in any and and um, meaningful and of uh, depth in any in any subject. Just about, you know, if that's you know what you, you're looking for, you know, um, in Mister Rogers, anywhere, you know. Um, thank you, and absolutely. Well, great talking to you again. Same, same here. <laughs> all right. Okay. Okay. Enjoy the rain. I am from my view <laughs> up here in the north, north country. I think it's heading our way. I heard it's it, going to rain oh, later. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. It's, it, it's, it's going to be heavy duty, but it'll be, it'll be good. All that right. Sounds man. great. Okay. Good, good talking uh, to you. Same here. Yeah. I, I always, nice to see you. It's always nice you too. All right. Okay. Take care. Bye now. Bye.